<laughs> okay, so, but we had it working. God damn it, this Windows Defender is getting better and better by the day. This time we're doing a red versus blue attack and we're naming it, we got breached. So Fabio, how, how are we gonna do this? So we're gonna send a phishing email to a user. The user is gonna open it, it's gonna look fine. The attacker is gonna get a shell. We're gonna start working a little bit in the environment to see what we can do from there. And then we're gonna look like, we're gonna look at the defense side or the detect side and see like if we actually have proper tooling in place, how does this look like? How can we detect it and how should we respond? Perfect, so let's do that. In this case, you are going to be Megan and I'm gonna be the attacker. So I do have an email from Bobby. Bobby Tables, it's called. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard the name before. <laughs> and it's an invoice, <laughs> so I think you should really open up the invoice. So inside this attachment that you're gonna open up, it's a custom reverse shell. So first off, we need to have a reverse shell and something that listening to, to that. I'm just gonna use uh, a Metasploit for this and just put this up. So we start run this RC file here. We're also gonna start to run a proxy listener. This is a custom thing that we built. Fabio, can you tell me a little bit about the idea behind it and how it works? Sure. So this is a custom shell that we built for Red Team a couple of years ago. The way it works is that you have the client side, which is primarily PowerShell based, even though it starts with the JavaScript. It will initiate HTTP requests to a server that we control. And those requests will be actually like normal HTTP requests, but they will contain some special cookies. They will be cookies with encoded data into it, which is actually the, the, the content of our shell. What the server side is going to do is that it's going to extract the content of those cookies and decode it and decrypt it. And then it will side channel that information to the Metasploit listener that you have there, which is actually the only reason we use Metasploit is because it has a multi-session handler already built in and we didn't want to build it on our own. So once you take that traffic out, it will actually forward the original request to an upstream server, which can be whatever. It could be Microsoft, Google, whatever whatever you want to put. So it will forward that request and it will get the response real time from Microsoft or Google or whatever upstream server you configure. And then it will take the result of your commands uh, or your instructions from the Metasploit session. It will inject it into cookie headers and send it back. So you will basically have a split channel type of behavior, right? So you have the actual HTTP traffic is proxied to and from a legitimate upstream server while you side channel shell on top of cookies. It looks normal, uh, traffic looks great, and uh, it's a way for us to be able to stay under the radar, very, very sneaky. So I got my uh, my part up and running. Let's see what happens when you run the JS file. Right, so I have an attachment that is a zip file. I'm gonna go to my downloads. So what happens when I open my invoice attachment inside there, I have a JavaScript file, double click it, and if I don't care about this warning and I just click open, this will start the process in the background. And if all goes well, you should get a shell soon. There Boom, you go. There it is. Took a second. You can see it down here, the traffic is just going through and it's all sneaking through the, the cookies. So I'm going to see if I can get a session.i. Here we go. And then a couple of dashes. Who am I? I make it. Nice. Let's see what kind of network configuration Megan has. Okay, that looks good. I'm curious about what she has. Maybe you know some, let's do some ARP. A, what's in the network? Okay, we've got our 10, 10 addresses and some other things, interesting. Let's do net user slash domain. And there's a lot of people working at Megan's place. Nice, that's pretty awesome, but the thing doesn't, stop here. You can easily now put in some Active Directory enumeration scripts and do this. So, so let's see if we can, the Power View one, see if that works. <gasps> the script is malicious <laughs> and it's been, been, been blocked. That so we do have another yeah. version of that actually that we hosted on the server. Try to call the p1.ps1 instead of Power View obfuscated. Because Power View is basically taken off GitHub, right? We run some obfuscation in a couple different ways. The first version was obf obfuscated. The second one seems to have worked. Here we go. Get net user. <laughs> they block it again. It does not like when you start using Power View. So the initial, you know, kind of normal behavior, IP information and that kind of stuff, that's normal. But as soon as we run this obfuscated PowerShell, something hit. 
we're using not only Defender here, we're also using Defender for endpoints. So this is where this turned into an incident. Now a SOC somewhere got an alert. Malicious data has been run somewhere. And uh, should we just lo look into what happens on the blue side when something like this happens? Yeah, and this is actually a perfect example of how to mix custom malware and tools, known attack tools, right? Because as long as we did our custom shell and our custom activities, uh, then there was no alert, everything was fine, we could do whatever we wanted. As soon as we started using tools that are known or the tool behavior is known and detected by different tools, then we run into issues, right? Because there was an alert, our, our process was actually blocked. Uh, and then because we have Defender for Endpoint that generated an alert that someone will hopefully receive and investigate. But that also shows that different actors may very well have different uh, sophistication levels. Depending on what they use, you know, relying on antivirus or, or products that are pre-configured for you might not be enough. Okay, so this is Defender for Endpoint, Microsoft EDR solution. We can see here we have a bunch of uh, incidents and alerts that came up. Now let's check how the activities we've done on Mega's computer actually look like in here. You can see that uh, if you go under incidents, there are a few things open. There is an incident that has multiple alerts within it. And it says multi-stage incident involving execution and collection of multiple endpoints. And these are all the alerts, right? There is some suspicious PowerShell. There is an active PowerView tool that was blocked, right? That's when Defender actually found the PowerView uh, tool loaded in memory, because that's what we did. We didn't drop it on disk. We just loaded it in the PowerShell memory. The fact that we have obfuscated code in itself is an alert. So common techniques for obfuscating PowerShell code that was detected. So, I mean, just going through this is a good way to try and figure out uh, what was happening on the system. Now, of course, it's important that someone actually looks at these alerts and do the investigation. It's not uncommon that we go into customer environments and we, uh, you know, they had an incident, they have a breach, and we go in and say, well, you did have alerts like a week ago, you just haven't acted on it. Because it's awesome to have logging, it's awesome to have any kind of auditing, uh, but if you don't look at it, hey. That's right. So here we have the whole flow of events that happened when we click that attachment. This particular alert, suspicious PowerShell command line. Mm -hmm. If we check what's going on here, we see that this is a PowerShell process that was started on this day. And uh, this was the command line. It's a long base 64 encoded command. Defender for endpoint will also, also automatically decode that command for you. So you see the decoded version of it. It's still obfuscated, so it's not that readable or it's kind of readable, right? You see there is a web client um, and you see it tries to do some kind of download string and command invocation and it's going mm. to some uh, totally legit dot something. So now this is the actual alert, and this just gives you a starting point where to go and investigate. But what you really want to see is the timeline. Clicking here will bring you to the exact point in time when that alert was triggered, and it will show you all other events that happen on that system. And here you see everything from file creation, DLLs loaded into processes, network connections, and uh, sub-processes spawned by other processes and so on. So this suspicious PowerShell is the alert we saw before. And you see that right before there is a PowerShell that launched a script that was inspected by the AMC component of Windows. And here you have the actual process chain, which is pretty interesting because you see this is explorer.exe, right? So this is your Windows Explorer session as a locked on user. When you see processes that are created by explorer.exe, that is usually something that the user just double clicks. So if you see w, w script, that is the scripting engine in Windows, which is launched with a parameter that points to uh, update a local temp, and then there is some invoice id.zip, and then invoice something.js. Mm -hmm. That is a very clear indication that the user actively double clicked a JavaScript file inside the zip file, right? And uh, that in itself, when executed, starts another process, which is PowerShell, which is what triggered the alert in the first place. So the alert brings us here. Now it's up to us to actually investigate and see what happened. Now we have the script, right? If we're lucky, the script is still left on the system. Otherwise we can just check in Defender for Endpoint everything that has happened uh, and has been spawned or created or modified, whether it's a registry key, whether it's a file on disk uh, within the context of that process. Because now we have an indication, right? We know that on this particular computer, pc megan uh, there was PowerShell doing suspicious things, right? So the type of thing that we can do here is look for device process events where they're initiating process command line. 
contains PowerShell. Now, this is a very broad query. If you do this in a, in an actual like real environment, you're gonna be flooded with with events here. You're gonna have to filter this down in a more realistic case. But let's see here what we got. We've got a lot of uh, commands that were actually children processes of of PowerShell. That's my uh, We want to get uh, the timestamp. Yeah, that's your commands, right? So you're gonna get the timestamp. Now we only have this device, right? Otherwise we will filter per device. We can filter for specific process. Now we're just checking in general for PowerShell. You want to get the actual process command line, the initiating process uh, line, right? Even though we know that's the one, but at least ensure that it's that particular suspicious PowerShell and it's not another PowerShell. So then here we sort by time. Yeah, so not all of these PowerShell are actually the the malicious PowerShell. Now, if we just want to check for PowerShell that has executed with, for example, the dash EC flag mm -hmm. for a coded command, we can just add that. Initiated process, command line contains dash EC. So now these are actually only the suspicious or malicious ones, right? So these are basically all the commands uh, that has been done on this system. I, I look for those. Yeah, net user, uh, domain. You did ARP. Awesome. I did. We did IP config, mm -hmm. right? Let's do like this. We also want to get the device name in here because there is a nice feature as well. When you actually click on, say that you want to investigate exactly what happened in the timeline of the system when you did the net user domain, click on the device, it brings you to the timeline at that exact point in time. So you can see exactly what happened right before and right after. So you can correlate with other types of events, like has there been any file created on the system? Has there been any, any DLL loaded? So this is your actual command, right? That this suspicious PowerShell process, which is decoded to this one, spawn this particular process, right? That user slash domain. Then you can go further in time. Here you have the ARP and then you see every other event. So here you can really follow everything that happened. There is very little ways you can hide from this. If, if you if you have an EDR solution that logs that, it's going to be hard to clean it up once it's already done. And even if I, as an attacker, decided to format or delete or remove anything from the system, this is going to be sent to the central global database somewhere, and you're going to be able to query it. That's right. This is in Microsoft Cloud Service now. So uh, now we've shown a case where we ran some pretty obvious bad commands and there was some built-in capability within Defender for Endpoint that triggered it or the trigger mm -hmm. an alert because of that activity. And we went in and investigated. We can figure out that that's bad and we can follow the traces and see what other commands have been executed and so on. We also saw the JavaScript file, the zip file, and it was open from Explorer. It wasn't the downloads or actually it wasn't the local app data, uh, but it could have been a downloaded file by the users. Then you can go in and do deeper investigation and see did this coming from an email or did the user just browse on a site and download the file and so on. But they don't always look you know, this obvious, right? They don't always take long basic sport encoded commands and obfuscated known tools from GitHub and stuff like that. What you do is that you need to be ready to identify things that are suspicious, but not necessarily known beforehand. The typical way of doing things is setting up rules, uh, try and catch techniques that are commonly bad things. Like if you have a script and that one connects to internet, for example, that's usually an indication of something potentially bad happening. There is a lot of legitimate scripts that connect all over the place internally and sometimes even externally. So you can't just have that query and have it generate alerts for you because you're going to be flooded with false positives. David in the SOC told me the other day that, you know, there are some scenarios where it kind of looks like a false positive, but it's just a printer uh, that's doing this broadcast. It's, it's not a port scan. It's just a printer uh, or a printer driver looking to find printers to attach to. And that is legit traffic. It just looks very port scannerish. Yeah, there is a lot of legitimate stuff that looks very weird. So uh, you actually need to go through all of those uh, to understand how your environment looks like and what is actually expected and what's not expected and needs to be investigated. And that's the typical work that our SOC does, right? We create yeah. dozens of custom rules and then we trim them based on the customer environment so that we can detect a lot of stuff that is not known before, uh, but it's also mm. not a lot of false positives. And just to give you a very simple uh, example of how to do that, here I made a very simple query that says, uh, I want to find all the network events where uh, the connections are made for processes that are either syscript or wscript or PowerShell. Right. And out of that, I want to get this information, timestamp, device name, remote IP, remote URL, and so on. So again, in a, in a real environment, this is going to give you a lot of false positives. So you're going to have to trim it down and remove all the stuff that is good. 
Uh, but this is a really nice way to keep track of what's going on in your environment. And that's, that's something that uh, I think it's really great in Defender for Endpoint. I think there are a lot of good EDR tools, uh, but what I like about Defender for Endpoint is that the, the query engine uh, is actually really powerful. You can do a lot of advanced things here. Uh, we do sometimes queries that are maybe like 50 line long uh, query that correlate things to each other. Like, hey, give me all the systems that have been seen in the network. And out of those, give me the ones that I don't know anything about and that connect to this particular port on the systems. And then suddenly you have a view of uh, potentially all unauthorized devices on the network and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So you can make really cool queries and really nice custom detection rules based on that. So if you are a sysadmin and you want to get up and running with this, it's not that hard. And But if you are... If you're not that keen on spending time on looking at your logs and do it manually, and if you're not having your own 24-7 SOC, we got a lot of bunch of people uh, that work 24-7 to do that and monitor our systems all the time. So uh, you can always use TrueSec SOC. Yeah, and I think one important thing is to understand also, there, there is a lot of good stuff already built into the tool. So just installing the tool and having your local IT to look at it, it's a lot better than not having it. But at the same yes. time, looking at how the real attacks happen, they don't just wait for the next morning. They, they may very well happen in the weekend or in the middle of the night. So having a 24 seven in itself, just time-wise is very important. Then you also mm -hmm. need someone that is actually used to work with this type of stuff that uh, creates those rules and investigates the false positives based on what the attacks look like today, because those mm -hmm. things change all the time. We need to know, like there is this type of campaigns, attackers are using these type of tools, these techniques to hide, this, this uh, vulnerability is to jump around in the system. You need to be up to date with that and you need to know exactly how they look like when you go deep down into the system events and see how would I be able to detect that using a tool like this and how would I be able to figure out what's a false positive or not. So uh, having that load on your local IT is usually not recommended. You should probably have a dedicated SOC for that. I really hope you like this kind of technical deep dive uh, demo showcase. And uh, I hope that you're gonna be back here again for the next one. So to make sure that you're up to date what we're doing, please like, do subscribe and leave a comment here in the comments below. And we'll see you next time.